Hello, and welcome to Scandinavia House and tonight's book talk with Lisa E. Bloom on our new book, Climate Change and the New Polar Aesthetics, Artists Re Reimagine the Arctic and Ar Antarctica, out now from Duke University Press. In this, pub this new publication, Bloom considers the way artists, filmmakers, and activists engaged in the Arctic and Antarctic rep rep represents our cultural environment crisis and reconstructs public understanding, um, and which ties very well with our current exhibition uh, on the Arctic's edge, Artists Explores the Far North, presenting three contemporary photo-based artists um, whose works have versed regions from the Arctic Circle to probe themes ranging from time and memory to landscape and built environment to science and mythology to our climate change. And, and it features uh, the artists Marion Bellinger, Claire Benson, and Steve Giovinco, who is sitting right there. So the, the gallery is open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 12 to uh, 6. So if you have a chance, it is open up in, until March. Uh, so please do visit. It's a wonderful exhibition. Lisa E. Bloom is the author of many feminist books and articles in art history, visual culture, and cultural studies, including her book, Gender on Ice, American Anthologies of the Polar Expeditions from the University of Minnesota Press, the first critical feminist and post-colonial cultural studies books on the polar region, and her anthologies with other eyes, looking at race and gender in in visual cultures, also from the University of Minnesota Press, that demonstrate the feminist and post-colonial and anti-racist concerns that can be incorporated into the history of art. Her latest book, Climate Change and the New Polar Aesthetics, uh, examines aspects of feminism, environmental art, and conjoins, uh, conjoins issues roughly kept apart in climate change debates, uh, such as the fate of indigenous communities, re resurgent nationalism, globalization, globalizing capitalism, as well as the question of gender, race, and persistent post-colonial relations. Uh, she has taught and has been a researcher at numerous universities and art sc schools for over the years, including the University of California, Berkeley, where she was a scholar in residence at the Bertree Spain Center of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. Please do welcome Lisa E. Bloom to the stage. Hello, I want to begin by thanking Kyle Reinhardt for that introduction and for hosting me today. Um, thanks also for my friends and colleagues for coming. Um, it's good to see um, Kimi Taksue, who, um, um, whose uh, film, That Which Once Was, is discussed in my book. Thursa Goodeve, who interviewed me um, who interviewed me and Elena Glassberg about my book um, for an upcoming issue of the Art Lawn Online Art Journal that's coming out shortly, and Nicole Archer, who's here, who's the editor who commissioned the article. So thank, thank, thank you, everyone, and welcome. So um, I'm going to get set. The talk is about 45 minutes long, and, um, and we'll have time for hopefully 15, 20 minutes worth of questions. I'm going to start with um, a quote from Am Amitabh Ghosh um, from his book from 2016 called The Great Derangement. And he writes, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. As the climate crisis becomes increasingly severe, the Indian writer Amitav Ghosh reminds us that the planet risks becoming utterly unrecognizable, a world we cannot even imagine. Imagination is central to my book for expressing the strangeness unfolding around us in the Arctic and Antarctic and creating art and film and scholarship that can or orient us towards a more just and resilient world in the era of the so-called Anthropocene. Um, in what follows, the book brings art and film into conversation with new scholarship in these regions, connecting debates on science and the environment with gender, sexuality, race, and the relations of the human to the non-human. It takes into account resurgent nationalisms, and empire, and globalizing capitalism as these forces intertwine in the polar regions. The book addresses these issues against a backdrop of climate change politics, resource extraction, and a changing geopolitical order. 
It ties the history of polar exploration directly to the pursuit of fuels, beginning with whaling and continuing with the drive for fossil fuel extraction um, and 20, in the 20th and 21st centuries. The work discussed in the final chapters understands the Arctic's accelerated climate change, permafrost melt, and oil spills as they pertain to the slow violence against the environment. Throughout the book, the notion of slow violence, to use Rob Nixon's term as it applies to climate change, helps to describe many processes, including eroded indigenous rights, degradation of indigenous land, extinction of almost invisible species, and slow or indirect forms of psychological violence. Although I write about the polar regions collectively at times, it is important to be aware of their divergent histories. Though combined in the, in the popular Western imagination and, uh, and in art through more recent reports on their shrinking ice masses, these geographic spaces are nevertheless very distinct areas of the Earth. The Arctic is the northernmost region of the Earth and has a long history of human habitation and settlement by the eight Arctic nations that all have colonial legacies. Canada, Denmark, and then of course Greenland, um, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Russia, and the United States. The Antarctic cont continent has never had an indigenous population and remains the only place in the world without a stable or permanent human population. It has dozens of research stations, some year round, others seasonal, that operate under the guidance of around 30 individual countries. It is governed by an international agreement um, known as the Antarctic Treaty System that has remained in effect since 1961, where the Antarctic, entry, Antarctic Treaty entered into force, designating the continent as a quote unquote frozen laboratory for science. So in climate change and the new polar aesthetics, global warming is no longer simply an Arctic or Antarctic story um, that is unfolding remotely or in uninhabited so-called wastelands of little importance to the world. Rather, it's a crisis of both the human and natural world and the disasters unfolding there might start there but, not, but are not confined there. Contemporary discussions of present-day Arctic and Antarctic anthropogenic landscapes are not any longer about contemplating from a safe remove the destruction nature might wreak in inaccessible parts of the world. The melting of the polar ice caps will have significant repercussions for the globe as a whole, especially the continued existence of the world's coastal cities, New York, um, Miami, Houston, Amsterdam, Mumbai, Shanghai, and many others. Yet this early, earlier traditional sense of distance and remoteness contributed to the fascination of the polar regions and helped shape the globalist and colonialist Western histories and fantasies that in turn drove polar expeditions in the 19th and 20th centuries. My study refuses that distance and the sense of safety the faraway polar regions once afforded by confronting the evidence that this polar, that this polar ice has been affected by rising temperatures and that these changes in ice in turn contribute to the climate-related crises growing all over the world. Now, this section is called the Aesthetics of Finitude. In light of the urgency of the planetary crisis, the book explores the challenge facing artists articulating a specifically critical polar aesthetics that uncovers some of the forms of shape, forms and shapes of life in the Arctic and Antarctic under late capitalism at a moment of accelerated climate change. The book describes the new art as an aesthetic and sensorial phenomena that refuses the physical spectacle afforded by the old flag-planting heroism of explorations to the ends of the earth. It rethinks ecology and aesthetic practice together to challenge the political and social assumptions of an earlier epoch, promoting imperial entitlements and unbridled capitalism. The artists and filmmakers discussed here create works that counter colonial fantasies of endless exploration and escape, and instead find solace and even hope in more modest local phenomena. Uh, 
This is especially the case for the Inuit artists and filmmakers who inhabit part of the circumpolar north, who best understand an aesthetics of finitude and are experts on the question of how to survive and what it means to live in environmental conditions that are gradually becoming decreasingly degraded. This includes a discussion of films um, such as Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change by Zacharias Koenig and Ian Marrow, and it was the first to ask Inuit elders to describe the environmental changes they are experiencing in Inuit Nunugut um, in Arctic Canada in their own Inuit language. The documentary film um, Lament of the Land by Ashley Consolo Willocks um, and the local Inuit communities of Nunatsivit in Labrador, Canada, um, it provides, provides a striking example of how recognizing suffering from climate change in the circumpolar north can serve as a necessary first step towards the amelioration of that suffering by breaking the geographic isolation imposed on both individuals and communities and local and regional contexts through films such as this one. The fictional experimental film um, titled That Which Once Was oops, um, was is um, by Kimi Taksue is um, set in a future defined by climate breakdown when millions of people will be driven by their homes. Throughout the book, I highlight a democratic and collective, and, and I wanted to show you a still from um, Taksue's film um, about one of the characters who, um, and is, who is an artist who carves in ice. Throughout the book, I highlight democratic and collective art projects from around the world in order to build a new cultural commons from this perspective of women, queer, post-colonial, and indigenous artists and filmmakers who acknowledge and celebrate human interdependence with the non-human world. Artists in the book shake viewers about um, shake viewers out of routine assumptions about the natural world and invert the tourist gaze using strategies borrowed from postmodern art, science fiction, speculative fiction, and the Gothic horror genre. Indigenous filmmakers widen our purview to think of the entangled ecological dimensions of the Arctic, drawing on traditional indigenous knowledges and on more experimental approaches to filmmaking and art. The intersexual framework goes beyond naming categories to understanding the complex entanglement of nature and culture in the context of a modern visual tradition still influenced by the masculinist imagery of a sublime wilderness, a sublime wilderness from the heroic age of exploration that started in 1897 to 1922 that nevertheless reemerged in um, more modern forms to justify the imperial expansion that is accelerating the extraction of oil, gas, coal, and rare earth materials. Feminist artworks by Anne Noble and Judith Hersko on Antarctica challenge an aesthetics of the distance sublime from romantic aesthetics and its roots in European universalism the idea of a white and male-oriented domestication of nature. For them, representing climate change by sublime aesthetics often comes wrapped in a colonial nostalgia for an earlier image of Antarctica as a polar sublime landscape from the heroic day of age of exploration in the years bracketed by the deaths of the defining British celebrities, um, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Ernest Shackleton. And here's an image of um, Scott and another by Shackleton. You might be familiar with some of these well-known photographic images as well of Antarctica by photographers Herbert Ponting and Frank Hurley of that period that mythologized the idea of Scott and Shackleton's expedition as a heroic life and death struggle, one of the more common narrative tropes of Arctic and Antarctic exploration narratives in art. In Herbert Ponting's photograph of the Barn Glacier from 1910, the glacier dominates to such an extent that the figure in the landscape is tiny by comparison, easily engulfed by the vast icy landscape. Frank Hurley's blizzard of Cape 
Denison from 1912, in which silhouettes, um, figure, silhouetted figures struggling against the wind and cold are superimposed on a windy Antarctic landscape to illustrate the terror associated with the powerful, forbidding climate of that day. If you aren't familiar with that, photo, with that photograph of Hurley's, you've probably seen the one he took of Shackleton's ship, The Endurance, taken on the later 1914-1916 um, expedition. Um, this ship that was crushed by the ice was back in the news on March 9th, 2022, when Shackleton's ship was located, reviving the story about um, almost 100 years later about Shackleton and, an ex and his expedition members who survived nearly 11 months camped on the pack ice in Elephant Island. The power of the Antarctic over the imagination from that era before and after, uh, and dur before and during World War I is also anticipated by key texts in the history of the category of the sublime that regards sublime nature as awesome and overwhelming, but simultaneously invigorating as a moral experience and as an artistic device. Edmund Burke, in, in um, a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, written in the late 18th century, fittingly writes about the sublime and privation together. Privation is a theme also central to the popular record of Arctic and Antarctic exploration. Um, for Burke, quote, all general privations are, gen are great because they are all terrible vacuity, darkness, solitude, and death, and silence. As Mark Rawlinson argues in this frame of reference, the Antarctic is the embodiment, um, excuse me, as Mark Rawlinson argues in this frame of reference, the Antarctic is the embodiment of great and general deprivation and destitution. Left in Antarctica for months during the winter, um, the title of Asprey Cherry Gerard's memoir of Scott's last expedition, titled The Worst Journey in the World from 1922, might seem entirely unjustified as a measure of privation. Um, Cherry Gerard writes, Antarctica offers no fuel, no coastal food supplies, no orientation to the traveler, no possibility of human contact or care beyond the company of British man haulers. And so at the uh, Scandinavia house, people might not know what man, British man haulers were. Um, but um, unlike um, the, the Norwegians, um, the British decided that they were going to take to pull their sledges on their own because they did not want to use dogs. So I can come back, come back to that later. The negation, though, of this emptiness in the literature of the South Pole, an encounter with human footsteps, is Scott's sighting of Amundsen's flag and then his tent at 90 degrees south. These words are from British explorer Captain Robert Falcon Scott's diary of January 17, 1912, on the subject of the Antarctic Pole. Quote, great God, this is an awful place and terrible enough for us to have labored to it without the reward of priority. Now for the run home and a desperate struggle, I wonder if we can do it. When Scott wrote these words, he and his men had just arrived at the South Pole, only to find that the Norwegian explorer Amundsen had gotten there a month before them and left a tent to mark the fact, as you can see. Already in bad shape, um, the British team were bitterly disappointed and had to face the long journey back in the knowledge that they were not the victors. In fact, these were not Scott's truly last words since he did not die for another two months, but they mark an absolute turning point in his fortunes and, res and, um, and resonate with the desperation of the team the team must have felt after their foreboding of death on the return dur journey, during which all five men of the team perished. With Scott's priorities snatched away by Amundsen, the loneliness of the polar pair polar party materializes in a realization of remoteness and um, failing strength as they never make it back to the base. The, the ordeal is exacerbated, exacerbated by falling short of a sublime limit. Now, um, 
I'm going to shift to some of the feminist artists that I spoke about earlier. Um, and I wanted to start with Anne Noble's Barn Glacier from 2001. Um, that um, reference and comments on these iconic images of sublime wilderness from the heroic era that shows the inhospitable space of the Antarctic as a male testing ground in which isolation and physical danger combine with overwhelming beauty. Substitution and humor are central to Noble's um, postmodern strategy, representing Antarctica and contemporary tourism in immersive environments such as IMAX theaters and theme parks type exhibitions both outside and within Antarctica. In works such as this one, Noble presents two dummies dressed in a National Science Foundation standard issue um, extreme weather gear, standing before a panoramic photograph of the Barn Glacier in an Antarctic-themed in indoor entertainment center in New Zealand. Her photographs use beauty and space in less conventional ways by reversing Ponting's use of composition. Her image, in contrast, is tightly frame framed and almost claustrophobic, robbing the setting of its epic character. While the photographic beauty of her images is essential to their meaning, she is also asking us to rethink the sublime um, we think the way the sublime can be experienced as an artificially stim simulated landscape environment, creating an uncanny commentary about the contradictions between the Antarctica visualized in Hurley's and Ponting's photographs and the kitsch aesthetic of sublime wilderness now produced in indoor settings such as the Antarctic Center in New Zealand where she took this photograph. The point for Noble is what is sold in these contemporary tourist sitting, settings is not global warming, but the promise of Antarctica's mythical past and its history of privation in which icebergs, glaciers, penguins, whales, and white male heroes dominate and define their horizon and white man's endurance. On the other hand, um, Judith Hersko, like, uh, like Anne Noble, hold on. Judith Hersko, like Anne Noble, searches for new ways to tell stories about the, about the invisibility of the significant labor and Herculean role of tiny life forms like the sea butterfly and, and the sea angel um, in the Antarctic Oceans. In this way, her work brings together the feminist question of the scale of the personal to the non-human to acknowledge the connectedness and relationality of the humans, of the human and more than human. Um, that such planktonic or organisms are considered um, the canaries in, in the coal mine when it comes to the state of the oceans in the era of climate change is at odds with a world where large mammals such as polar bears are preferred as the icons of anthropogenic climate change. Other artists in this book that work with scientists in the circumpolar north um, include Ursula Beeman, who's um, worked in Greenland and Disco Bay in her 2015 video essay, Sub-Atlantic, Sub uh, which is on water chemistry and submerged landscapes. Here she focuses on microorganisms in the water that are important genetic, genetic materials that were released from the ice over 400,000 years ago. Combining science fiction and documentary, she pays more attention to non-human actors and their powerful agency in shaping contemporary political landscapes. In another short experimental film that she did titled Deep Weather from 2013, she connects the search for fossil fuels in the tar sands in Alberta, Canada, to its unexpected consequences on post-colonial South Asia with the poor and marginalized indig indigenous Bangladeshis as its most violently affected victims. Working with indigenous communities on the front lines of environmental and climate disaster, um, her video essay makes imaginable a crisis that is geographically dispersed and complex, often punishing those least able to respond and recover. Others who work in the Arctic and collaborate with indigenous communities include um, Sabankar Banerjee, a well-known Indian American photographer, scholar, and activist, who is one of the first artists and writers on the Alaskan Ar Arctic to develop a form of environmental art photography in collaboration with indigenous communities. 
He reimagines what counts as data in the context of big oil and the resurgence of territorial empire in the Arctic National Wild right Refuge, Wildlife Refuge, which I'm going to refer to as ANWR. Banerjee's use of color photography to portray four seasons of life on the refuge records both endangered, endangered life and the changing temporality of the seasons, particularly around the area where drill, drilling would take place. His work came to public attention when his early photographs from Anwar, the largest remaining stretch of wilderness in the United States, was first used as evidence in a bitterly contested Senate debate in March 2003 over whether, we sh whether it should be open for oil drilling. His work reframed the way we visualized the Arctic over a 12-month period and challenged the human-centered imperial depiction of the region as a frozen wasteland year-round put forth by then Senator um, Frank Murkowski, also the former governor of Alaska. In March 2002, in a moment of Senate theatrics, Murkowski had held up a flat white poster board and said, quote, this is a picture of the refuge as it exists for about nine months of the year. This is what it looks like. It's blank, it's flat, and it's unattractive. The discussion of Banerjee's work came out of one of the chapters that I collaborated on with Elena Glassberg, where we were primarily interested in how artists from the past two decades who collaborate with or are themselves from indigenous communities produce and what we broadly call data facts, material things, images, and their practices of production and circulation in order to intervene in official state and corporate narratives and images of environmental degradation and climate change. To do this, these artists develop their own alternative methods of measurement, pushing to question the very constitution, production, analysis, and circulation of climate discourse. They engage with a problem that goes beyond the suppression of specific images or data to the very redefinition of what constitutes evidence of changes in the ice, land, and animals of the polar region to create alternatives to address the environmental and social changes that are disproportionately and negatively affecting Arctic livelihoods. For example, Andrea Bauer's 2009 work, Mercy, Mercy Me, rememorializes the struggle over the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989 and its incomplete cleanup, not from a scientific perspective, but from the point of view of both the local indigenous and white community members who have had to live with the damage over generations. In um, Ken Sarah Weaver's land last words, the beadwork um, of the banner was created in collaboration with Gwich'in and white artists and its words refer to the famous speech of the Nigerian writer and environmental activist, Ken Sarawiwa, who led a nonviolent campaign against the degradation of land and abuse of his people by um, the Shell Oil Company. The banner reads, quote, Lord, take my soul, but the struggle continues. Um, her work, Bauer's work, is a dark commentary on how insubstantial and incomplete demonstrations and protests are and how work for social change is often forgotten and erased by the inevitable next catastrophe. She is interested in representing what Subankar Banerjee calls quote unquote long environmentalism in the case of an environmental engagement that has lasted a quarter century and the way it has created a culture and history of its own. Still, other artists do creative activism in the museum and or in the streets and join collective environmental social movements around the world in um, building on the galvanizing effect of continuing concern over past oil spills and imminent climate emergencies. The work of activist artists such as Liberate Tate working in Britain, um, this is a performance called License to Spill, um, that was at the Tate Britain, um, and not an alternative a group from Brooklyn, working in Brooklyn, did a piece called Expedition Bus at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, both of these works aims at holding Western art, natural history, and science museums to account for their complicity through the solicitation and acceptance of corporate sponsorship and in enabling climate change and perpetuating the colonial narratives that underlie it. 
in including activist groups like Idle No More and Shell No, um, that um, was um, a, for a protest over Arctic drilling in 2015 in Seattle, Washington. The book also highlights the ongoing structural transformation of artistic work from outside conventional art institutions in relation to climate justice politics. All these artists and filmmakers emphasize the role of an artistic and literary imagination to question routine assumptions about the natural world and its future, simultaneously challenging the political and social assumptions of European and Western masculinist colonial practices. Much of the work discussed in the book is embodied, situated, and earthbound, literally, quote unquote, down to earth, as um, the late um, Bruno Latour puts it, addressing earthly, even lowly, or humbly, humble materials such as water, ice, dirt, and microscopic marine life that artists nevertheless treat with care and imagination through reuse and recycling. The book foregrounds justice, attentive aesthetic research practices that artists incorporate into art to explore conceptions of beauty, troubling environmental truths, and ethical challenges that come with living in an unstable and contingent finite world. As the planet is proving more and more uninhabitable, the heroic ethos has returned with inventions to overcome planetary catastrophe. The heroic is understood as a reactionary political and cultural stance that seeks to claim lost wilderness and to reassert control over nature, nature often in league with modern techno-fix fantasies linked to further industry deregulation of environmental protection and the belief in an infinite horizon. Some of the ideas from the heroic legacy of polar exploration, notions of sublime wilderness, imperial conquest, and geographic extremes, um, mass resource extraction, scientific adventure, and the renewal of masculine selfhood tested against a so-called hostile environment have returned in our current ideas, which also include new fantasies. These include space exploration as colonization by some of the world's richest men, such as Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and of course, Elon Musk, who dream of escaping to Mars to start a settlement colony from Earth. Um, the science makes it clear, though, that there's no escape to the heavens, no, no planet B, as the activists say. And the book is very much focused on this world that we actually inhabit, even though polar exploration was, for an earlier time, the equivalent of space exploration. In both cases, the fantasy of ever-expanding resources and territory stemmed from a vividly colonialist imagination and a compulsion to repeat and discover more territory, more resources, more products for consumption, more profits. The book connects nascent and resurgent imperialist heroism and conquest in the polar regions to artistic responses to climate change and the Earth's finitude. Um, in doing so, the book concerns art that creates a new kind of imagination and seeks to find new footing within the Earth's limits, grounded in existing social reality rather than starry-eyed fantasies of plundering or occupying other planets outside our solar system. The book reprises and si extends significant post-colonial and feminist scholarship from the past three decades on the visual culture of the Arctic and Antarctic, um, my um, book, Gender on Ice, um, um, American Ideologies Polar Expedition, described how British and American explorers in the early 20th century perceived the Poles as a proving ground for a colonial masculinity and as an em empty imperial frontier to plunder, quote, um, I wrote, a tabula rasa where people, history, and culture vanish. Gender on Ice was one of the first books to bring Arctic studies and to a lesser extent Antarctic studies into conversation with critical intersectional feminist scholarship on gender, race, science, art, colonialism, and nationalism. Much of my feminist and post-colonial writing on the art of these regions since then has, been, has built on this initial foray, including an international conference um, that um, an online journal it, um, of the scholar and the feminist from Barnard College in New York City that I did um, with, um, El, that I collaborated on with Elena Glassberg and Laura Hay in 2008. 
as well as more recent articles on feminism, colonialism, art, and ecology, which I develop further in, in this book. And um, since many of you are interested in the Scandinavian countries, some of these books might interest you. The Arctic Environmental Modernities um, book, um, and um, this one is on Antarctica, um, done by some key people in the field. And then um, for, um, this is, has German and I think um, Norwegian author for Arctic Archives. And then um, a book that I think is really important in the arts and visual culture that I very highly recommend. Um, it was edited by Subankar Banerjee, um, Emily Eliza Scott, and TJ Demas, and now thankfully is out in paper, so it's a little less expensive. So, um, Anyway, so some artists who, um, who, who were inspired by my early scholarship in Gender on Ice, which came out decades ago in 1993, um, and these artists include um, Judith Hersko, who I briefly discussed, Kaja, and now I'm going to discuss Kaja Aglet and Isaac Julian, who I write about in the book, and they recover the history of, um, in the case of Julian, African-American men's involvement in polar exploration using fictional approaches that imagine alternate histories. These artists revitalize these older heroic narratives from the perspective of subjects who were historically er excluded or whose involvement was ignored, and at the same time comment on the way climate change interferes with the way we view the Arctic today. So I wanted to start with a Swedish artist. Um, uh, okay, oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to also, before I go on, um, show you a book um, that my collaborator, Elena Glassberg, did. Um, and, um, and she collaborated with me on chapters four and five of the book. And, um, and she's the author of Antarctica as Cultural Critique, the Gendered Politics of Scientific Exploration and Climate Change from 2012. So. So anyway, moving to Kaja Aglert, who is a well-known Swedish um, feminist art and professor who lives in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, she, whose piece, Winter Event, Antifreeze, um, um, started with an artistic residency in 2009 to Svalbard. Um, the ongoing event project was then realized as a complex conceptual artwork that over the years was a solo, solo expedition at um, performance spaces, galleries, and museums. And I think her last um, museum exhibit was at Tromsø in, Nor in Norway. Um, she explores um, in her work um, white heroic masculinity and nationalist failure in the Arctic and in the past, and its recuper recuperation and rehabilitation in the present, not as a source of admiration or esteem, but as a destructive act. Her artwork throws these heroic myths of desperation and failure back at the audience, and in doing so, suggests how misguided um, such projects, projects that serve the purposes of nationalism and imperialism might have been to begin with, especially in light of the reverence with which they were subsequently treated. Um, um, so I wanted to give you an example. Here she is um, in Svalbard. Um, and, um, and so the first image I wanted to show, the first example I wanted to show you was a photograph of the balloonist, um, Andre, um, that many people know from Sweden. And this was taken by the, his third expedition to the North Pole um, in um, the late 1890s. And this was taken by Niels Strindberg. And the, um, the negatives um, were lost and were recovered only in 1930. And since then has become one of the most famous visual representations of the failed Arctic exploration in Sweden. This image was included in Aglert's Antifreeze Artist publication and depicts Andre posing with his rifle over dead, of a dead polar bear that he had presumably shot. Her rereading of this heroic pose, one of the more iconic images of imperialism in the Arctic, alters the meaning from hunting trophy triumph to the paradox that this leads to the explorer's death. Um, death. Years later, um, it was discovered the parasites in the uncooked polar bear flesh were pro proven to have killed him, killed him and his men. 
Aglert's dark humor, though, is not limited to her choice of images, and this is just one of many, but encompass the totality of her thinking about what it means to follow in the footsteps of these male, failed male fortune seekers who have been traveling to the Arctic since the 18th century in the hope of returning home with fame and fortune. She is informed by, she is inspired by feminist scholarship and the work of Fluxus artist George Brecht's ingeniously simple score titled Winter Event Antifreeze as a basis of her own radical critique of white male failure. Brecht's score was a way to, for art to, quote, ensure that the details of everyday life, the random constellation of objects that surround us, stop going unnoticed. But she expands on the effect of Brecht's work beyond the context of 1960s art to transform how we see the Arctic today through cliches of romanticism and the traditional sublime. Um, by contrast um, to, to um, Aglet's work, um, I wanted to first discuss, I wanted to finally discuss Isaac Julian, who is an internationally known um, black British artist, filmmaker, and professor whose multi-screen film installations and photographs incorporate different dis disciplines to create a poetic and unique perspective on, on in this case, the Arctic. This multi-screen immersive installation project titled True North returns us to US heroic Arctic exploration narratives and their myths more than 100 years after Robert Perry's expedition. Oops. Sorry. It is told from the vantage point of the African American polar explorer Matthew Henson, okay, whose own witnessing authority and claims to the 1909 discovery at the North Pole were consistently written out of the script by white polar explorer Robert Perry. Both his work and Aglert's reframe the, Antar the Arctic landscape in terms of an everyday context an agent in a more than human social life and what Julian calls a quote unquote contaminated sublime and creates a reconfigured history that unsettles the idea of pleasure that we derive from the Arctic's beauty and extraordinary landscape. At the same time, Julian seduces the audience visually when he rewrites the narrative of a subservient Henson concocted by Perry in a visual register far from what one expects. To do this, the film radically departs from Henson's story by including a black actress, Van Vanessa Meary, scantily dressed in high fashion. Whoops, oh no, it's out of order. Okay. <laughs> to impersonate Henson in the Arctic. Julian's use of the commercial aesthetics of fashion photography, casting Miri wearing a white summer dress, transforms the Arctic into an inviting place with sunny skies and summer weather, all as a consequence of global warming. This brazen and incongruous strategy queers and parodies not only an older anti-black discourse of climate determinism, which argues that people could not belong in the North because they were unable to survive the freezing cold temperatures, and um, racial notions of leadership, but also the era's regressive gender politics, um, especially a highly simplified and formulaic narrative of white meta masculine heterosexual agency prevailing over feminized space as depicted in Robert Perry's 1898 photograph titled, of all things, Mother of the Seals, an Eskimo lech, where his mistress is cast as occupying an uncertain position between the human and the animal, lying nude on a rock and rendered passive as a natural resource or as a sexual object for Perry's use. Julian's choice to include Sami actors um, in True North to represent to represent um, the men in Perry's actual expedition serves to remind us of the important partition, participation of Inuit men in Perry's expedition. His use of close-ups of the Inuit faces on multiple screens destabilizes Perry's racialized hierarchy and presents them as legitimate subjects rather than as laboring, the laboring bodies and exotic props that Perry presents in his photograph of Henson and the four Inuit men from the Greenland Arctic at the North Pole in 1909. Um, so, okay, I'm going to move to the epilogue and um, I wanted to start with a quote by Kim Stanley Robinson. And he writes, um, we are now living 
um, in a science fiction novel that we are all writing together. So what he means is the present feels dangerous and volatile, but just how quickly the world will become permanently unrecognizable is not yet clear. As I completed this book in the fall of 2021, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, the dire forecast for global warming seemed more consequential and urgent. We were not ready for the pandemic at the end of 2019, even though experts had warned of its possibility decades ago. Nevertheless, effective international responses to COVID-19 vaccines have offered glimmers of hope. Not so with climate change. The uncanniness and feelings of estrangement caused by the climate crisis continue to pervade the circumstances of our own lives, as the last few days in New York show um, with the um, 60 degree plus weather in February. But countries worldwide still continue to pump out the emissions that cause climate change, and the world unfortunately remains far off track to avoid catastrophic unraveling. Yet even as the impact of climate breakdown comes to be felt everywhere, government climate policy is woefully inadequate, and the urgency of the crisis is still not really getting through. In the midst of this inadequate response, however, the artists and filmmakers discussed find a way to integrate climate activism, aesthetics, and scientific fact, using, using the often suppressed and largely ignored evidence of climate change in the polar regions and the circumpolar north. The artists treat the climate crisis as an immediate emergency of the future. The New Zealand artist and photographer Joyce Campbell, who did the book's cover, uses outdated technology, the daguerreotype, and borrows from this Gothic sublime aesthetic, taken from the 19th century romantic painting, landscape painting tradition, to rethink the role of art in grappling with issues of the Anthropocene. There's terror, but there's also rage in Campbell's 2006 daguerreotype photograph titled Ice School of a screaming face of a melting glacier taken at the Ross Sea region of Antarctica by the New Zealand-based contemporary artist um, but, you know, of Antarctica. But Ice School also makes us think how climate change is precisely like the Gothic that haunts our every day um, through repetitions of cause and effect and the, very, and the way it is always there in a liminal and uncanny presence in our life now. This haunting is also conceptual and corporeal and should be embraced in contemporary art as part of the ecological uncanny as it enables us to reimagine through art our current ecological condition and how that operates through emotions that include terror and dread. This work, as well as others in the book, challenge the notion that traumatic experiences of the climate crisis can only be adequately represented through more traditional Western avant-garde or modernist aesthetic forms that avoids realism and draws on the old distinction between art and mass media, high and low culture. Like in my earlier book, Jewish identities in American feminist art, um, Ghosts of Ethnicity, where I argue that the manifestation of American feminism in the arts also pushed away from a stringent form of visual asceticism to express the intellectually difficult questions of our day. Here, like in my earlier book, I embrace a much wider d diversity of cultural aesthetic forms, but in this case, to engage sympathetically with new scholarship and activism in these regions that conjoins issues routinely kept apart in climate change and its aesthetic that engages landscape, environment, and ecology. Discus discussions on art and film that deal with ice, and particularly melting ice, um, might be a source of dread for most of us who will be impacted by rising sea levels. But in my book, there is a counter to dread that offers compelling ways to expand our political imagination about how we tell stories about ice and our relationship to ice in ways that could help us reimagine and remake the planet in ways more livable to all of us. For example, Kimi Taksue's short film, That Which Once Was, sparks cross-cultural conversations in order to imagine the future for memory in an increasingly precarious world. 
broadening the conversation of climate trauma, a term first used by um, film scholar Ian Kaplan in her book, Climate Trauma, Foreseeing the Future in Dystopian Film and Fiction. Toxway's film, as well, there, as well as others in the book, encompass indigenous and minority peoples and perspectives and use a range of me media to create a sense of possibility for themselves amid the, amidst the ongoing destruction of their environment by anthropogenic climate change. The epilogue, Seeing from the Future, extends the book's thesis, stating that the world continues to remain off track to avoid catastrophic unraveling. To inspire us to interrogate the future we are creating, the epilogue connects the failure to slow the climate crisis to the significance of more recent climate art activism that, established, that challenges established forms of coll collective thinking and acting. The book ends with an alternative vision of the, of the future proposed in a short climate fiction film by Naomi Klein, um, artist Molly Crabapple, and Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, that was um, posted on The Intercept and was seen by over 20 million viewers when it was first posted. And in, in many ways, it's linked to the works of artists and activists discussed in this book who treat the climate crisis as an immediate emergency of the future. It concludes by asking what other for future for the world might be possible by recognizing the polar now made perceptible through the new polar aesthetics. Thank you. Lisa, it's amazing to see you do such an expert job of in an hour encapsulating so much of what's in the book. Um, you know, you, you cover so much, and you do such a good job of, of introducing us to so many different um, artists, filmmakers, scholars, activists, and so on and so forth. And you've been working on this for eight, over eight years now, 10 years. My question is really quite simple. It's quite, it's, 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 I'm curious personally how you feel um, from, say, when you started to do this work and all the people that you've met and um, speaking all over the place, do you feel uh, any more um, optimistic because of the uh, growing numbers of, of artists and activists that are interested in it, or do you kind of go back and forth? Well, I wanted to say when I was brought back to this project in part by, um, you know, sort of working with Ellen and Glassford and Laura Kay at Barnard College when they invited me to um, participate and be co-editor of this issue of the journal, um, I, you know, we put together an amazing international ex, um, ex, um, conference together where we brought in people from around the world. And it was such an exciting moment. Um, the artist, Isaac Julian, who I just discussed, was one of the artists we brought in. And he, we, he still talks about it to this day. It was really just fantastic. But um, ironically, the um, conference took place on the day um, that Lehman fell in New York City. Yeah. And <laughs> Lehman. So the the first day of the fin the main the first day of the financial crisis. So, so and it was so it was a, like a marker because we were at the kind of height of a lot of interest in climate change and you know artists coming together to do this kind of work, and it was like an exciting moment and that just dissipated with after the financial mm -hmm. crisis and so. So I have gone through ups and downs. I mean, that was like a high point. And then um, it took us, uh, took me a while to kind of go back and get back on track. Because they were the interests, um, you know, in these topics had really shifted dramatically. And so um, I continued to collaborate with Al Glassberg. Um, we wrote several articles together and we tried to keep each other going. And um, and so, you know, I, I think it was just through my persistence of not giving up. And then, you know, and then eventually a climate movement started and we have people like Bill McKibben, McKibben. And I, you know, wanted to show you that um, sort of video that Naomi Klein did, which was absolutely sensational. And that became part of the Bernie Sanders campaign, mm -hmm. actually. That film, um, Naomi Klein collaborated with Bernie Sanders. So, um, so you know, and then we we finally got some climate legislation, 
um, which is, of course, is a watered down version of what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez actually wanted. But nevertheless, we're, we're getting somewhere, and you know, and this is already exciting. Mm -hmm. But of course, now with the war in Ukraine, you know, the climate activism that again was building, and with COVID, everything dropped again. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of building up. And, um, and so I feel like it's a seesaw, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And of course, with four years of Trump, things really did get worse. We really lost some very precious years. And, um, and I did see the expedition, exhibition that you told me about at the Whitney on, um, you know, on Puerto Rico and the Hurricane Maria. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so that's like one of the first, um, you know, ex um, exhibitions that I've seen that actually deals with the aftermath of the climate crisis. So, you know, so that's comforting. And, and then there's, you know, I showed you all these books, but the anthology on climate change, visual culture and art history, I think is extremely important book. There's like 35 scholars who are doing amazing work on this topic. And I feel it's building, particularly amongst um, undergraduates, graduate students, younger people. So I feel like we're on the way up again. I'm just worried about, you know, the dips well, as they do well. come and go. Yeah. Since we're um, it, at this moment that you're giving this talk, the CAA conference is going on. Um, what kind of influence or, or interest in climate change activism, especially since there have been um, those very public spectacles of uh, young people throwing ketchup at artworks in the name of climate change. I don't think there are really any actual panels on the climate crisis. There's scholars who are presenting work individually, but there's not like a concerted effort. Interestingly, though, during you know the worst of COVID, when we were all at home and isolated, the CAA came out with its best conference, which really featured climate change during COVID. And, um, but we haven't had anything quite like that happen again since, um, you know, since that conference. But I do think, um, you know, I think it's, I, and you mentioned the activists. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I don't know how many people have, you know, picked up on the fact that, you know, the, there's a, different groups of activists mostly in the, well, actually around the world, um, that were th throwing soup at masterpieces in major museums in London, um, Germany, um, Australia, and, and got really pretty negative um, feedback from the museums themselves and the people that work there. Um, and, um, and some art critics also, you know, thought they likened a group to the Taliban and et cetera. But I mean, but at the same point, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, the kinds of art activism that I like are, you know, very directly targeted, but these works were actually important in the fact that they did not, um, you know, the art was never damaged um, and they made a concerted effort that that would be the case. And it did draw attention to, to the climate crisis. And, um, and I think it's indicative of where we might be headed, actually. I mean, we are in trouble. And, um, and everyone seems to be asleep. And, um, and so, you know, activists are going to become more and more emboldened and worried, um, particularly um, young people. Um, and, you know, and things are picking up again. So I feel like, um, you know, what we need is a change in leadership. We need museums. They don't need to be urged on by young people. They should be mature enough to change their policies, to rethink issues and take this issue for what it is and and take it serious and take the seriousness of the issue to heart and to change policy to rethink how we want to think about art um, life everything at this moment um, and um, and it, it shouldn't take activists who are you know creating these sensationalist spectacles in order to get us to a point where we need to be i mean before um you know covid it had been you know there was this moment that i write about in the book where you had you know you have climate activists that are literally teenagers or young people in their 20s and a group of teenagers went to diane feinstein's office in san francisco and got really upset with her 
and she answered them very poorly, and they videoed it. And then it got circulated all over. I mean, you know, and so, you know, so young people were, were really doing the hard work. I mean, they weren't threatening property or appeared to be threatening property. So I, you know, I feel like people, are, once they understand what is really happening, are very upset. And, um, and so I feel, you know, sort of hopefully others Beside, you know, I think others besides myself are certainly working on these issues, including Thurza and Betty Sue Hertz, who's in the audience, and others. And there's a lot of, you know, interest on, um, you know, and thinking about these things. But I feel like in the context of all these other issues that I discuss, and it's really important to bring in the politics and the history of colonialism and capitalism, and not just create, it's, it's not just a purely scientific issue that's over there. It's part of our lives, and it's linked to all these other issues and needs to be discussed as such. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much. It's really interesting to hear as I'm a visual artist and a photographer. I guess I'm curious about um, if you've, I guess you've looked at um, native people, native uh, um, artists, and I'm curious, like, how it, is it in alignment with Western views and if it's similar or how it's different and also special, like, is there a gender kind of notion with native artists or native people. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's a, thanks for bringing that up. Um, there's an artist in the book, um, her name, it's, uh, she's passed away. Her name is Annie Putaguk, and she's from, um, you know, with the Canadian Arctic from Nunavut. And she was, she was from, from a family of artists, um, someone who used drawing as a way to kind of respond to, um, to the deterioration of life where she was living. And um, did you know? And dealt with themes like um, you know, sort of um, you know, alcoholism, suicide, um, things, themes that were very um, significant in her uh, in her community. But you know, so it was more her subjective response to what she was living, which included climate change, but was connected to all these things and longer histories, obviously as well. So um, so th that's sort of, so she's in the book. The um, film um, Inwit Knowledge and Climate Change is probably something you might want to see online. Because it's, it's, you know, basically the perspective um, is, um, you know, sort of, and it's collaborative. And a lot of the work in the book is collaborative. Like Subankar Banerjee worked with indigenous people on his photographs and, and it, it comes from like a collaboration and activism as well. So, um, you know, of course the perspectives are, you know, are different. There's a wonderful book that I recommend called Arctic Voices that Subankar Banerjee um, edited that I would highly recommend because you could see how as a community, this is in Alaska, um, sort of a group of people came together that were indigenous, white. I mean, it was a very unexpected kind of set of collaborations that came through it. And I think these are like important examples. As I said, sometimes, you know, these are, you know, the, the effects of climate change can take decades to, you know, shift or these terrible oil spills. And so I feel, you know, what's happened, what's happened in Alaska is actually very interesting and it's really documented in Arctic Voices. And I feel artists like, you know, um, Andrea Bowers is participating in that. So, it, you know, the issues come out in different ways from different perspectives. But um, of course, you know, the, the most, you know, sort of the, a lot of the, the feminist perspectives are coming from, well, also from indigenous activists um, like Sheila Watt Cloutier, who um, you know was um, trying to respond to the pollution that her community is facing um, from um, you know from pollution. A lot of pollution in the water ends up in the Arctic, and then from eating seals and marine life, uh, it gets ingested in people in you know people's bodies. And so she um, did this kind of international campaign to try to, you know, call attention to it and um, and get help from the international community. And so, and she wrote a book um, called The Right to Be Cold, 
And I would say that's very much a feminist book. So the feminism just takes a different form in the indigenous context. So, um, but I think there's a, a lot coming out and, um, you know, from all these different perspectives, including indigenous ones. And, um, and I think that's been exciting in, in a certain sense. And they're being, and they're, it's be, being given more visibility too. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and um, listening to this rather long talk, but uh, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.